episode 116 of Mighty Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today, I'm interviewing Max Casa of Serenity Floats. Max has created a really interesting business centered around sensory deprivation floating. And this is something that actually made a YouTube video about several years ago, interviewing an owner of a float spa down in Southern California. And the mistake that I made is I didn't do consecutive floats. So before getting one of Max's tanks, I would float on average once a year, sometimes less. And after talking with Max, I understand now that it's really important to do three consecutive, at least within the same week, but ideally on consecutive days. So I live fairly outside of the city here with my chickens and goats. Part of the reason why I moved to Idaho was to homestead. And so it would be a drive for me to go to a flotation spa. So I decided to get my own unit, and after researching, I ended up with Serenity Floats and Max's company, and I'm so glad that I did because he's really thought out a lot of the kinks and pitfalls that occur with your cheaper rectangular tanks. So I notice a lot of people will do social media fasts, whether it's for a day or a few days. I do that every few months and it's very beneficial. feels really good on my brain to take a break from the constant messaging back and forth with answering people's questions. It's a stress. There's no doubt about it. Even though I enjoy doing it, just looking down at this little box in my face all day long, day in and day out, even taking breaks that can be a pretty significant stress. So as someone that runs my business online, I was looking for solutions on how to keep my brain healthy while still sharing information online and creating content. And floating somehow came up in my awareness. And it's been incredible to float Almost every day, I take some days off here and there, but to float at least, say, four days a week, just for one hour, is a huge reset. And your mind will actually have no sense of time, so you can fully relax. I mean, one hour has felt like two or three hours for me, and I've found that to be a instant reset for my nervous system. So there's something to be said about unplugging. And it's another thing to talk about accelerated unplugging. And that's what sensory deprivation is. Not only stepping away from your devices and your screens and the internet, but having no light, no sound, and being completely weightless it's really fascinating what that does to the nervous system specifically. So I'm going to let Max explain it. He's the expert. Enjoy the show. All right. I'm here with Max Casa. Welcome to the show. My man, pumped to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for taking the time to come on and talk about sensory deprivation floating. It's something that I never imagined that I'd be able to do at home. Uh, yeah, I think you actually saw my YouTube video from I guess four or five years ago of a place in Southern California. And uh, I think I only did on average one a year, maybe one every two years. And then we had a conversation on the phone where you started to just within five or 10 minutes breaking down a lot of misconceptions I had about floating. Cause I was looking into an eBay model, you know, just a cheap, um, 
just float tank, even I think like a soft shell or like different kinds to get in my house. And uh, very fortunate for you to steer me away from that <laughs> and onto the right, the right path, something that's more sustainable, that's higher quality, that actually works. And uh, yeah, it's just been really life changing. Uh, I guess the last month now that I've been floating in your in your tank, it's truly beyond words what it's done for me. So thank you. <laughs> no man, I'm pumped to hear that. Pumped to hear that. You know, I think it's a a missing piece in many people's journey. You know, like especially when we're on the health path, there's so many things we're fixated on, whether it's diet meditation, sleep, whatever it is. But I truly believe just kind of unplugging from the matrix a little bit and getting away from all that sensory overload. You know, our brains are constantly being over inundated with all this information. Just be able to unplug and get back to that baseline is uh, extremely peaceful, and extremely healing. And uh, I'm pumped we got you in one, brother. About time. Yeah, you said the, the key phrase there, sensory overload. I think as you are... We're always online, responding to people's questions, running a business, using social media platforms. And there's so many good aspects to Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and social media. But there's also so many ugly aspects where, you know, the trolls and the haters and just the drama. And of course, you have the blue light, you have the EMFs, so you just get hit with so many things. But a lot of it is just that dopamine, right? And I've been there where from waking to sleeping i'm staring at this little box and that is my world because maybe it's my only connection to the outside world <laughs> i live in the woods or whatever and so yeah. i've been just over time getting back to balance taking breaks but this is like an accelerated way to recover from sensory overload right because you can meditate you can go on a walk in the woods but this is another level yeah and like you said Dude, like everyone realizes that when we take a few minutes, whether it is a walk on the woods, whether it is to meditate, whatever it is, to just unplug and disconnect. When we take a few minutes to do this, everyone recognizes that you feel better naturally, right? So it still blows my mind how few people take that to the extreme and really want to test their limits and just be like, hey, like how deep can I push this, this button of serenity, you know? And what we do, and we take the time to just unplug, get away from all the sensory overload, go into a place or an environment like this that's unique because we're no longer getting bombarded with all these signals. I know we talk about EMF. I know we talk about Wi-Fi and all these things, but we're constantly being bombarded with all sorts of signals from all of our senses. And when we do that, the level of relaxation and peace that we experience, even after just 60 minutes, is absolutely incredible. Incredible. Yeah, I forget what percentage uh, of our energy the brain uses. Was it, I think, 20% of our energy or maybe 30%, something like that? The Man, brain it, yeah, even for our nervous system in general, we got to recognize our nervous system, one of, not many people look at it this way, you know? We look at stressors and we see things like emf we see things like toxins in our diet and our air and all things like this but one of the largest most impactful stressors to the human body that we face on a regular basis is actually the sensory information and gravity itself so 80 percent of our nervous system's workload every single day is designated towards dissecting and processing all this sensory overload along with fighting the forces of gravity. Like you can imagine, even me and you right here, we're sitting here, we're hanging out. But if I'm here, my spinal cord, the, brace my, the, the base of my brainstem is working incredibly hard to stop my head from just drooping to the side, <laughs> you know? Uh, but all the, all the time, this is a, a large stressor on our nervous system and it work, it's working very hard. So getting into a zero gravity-like environment, getting away from the sensory information, is very important and then all of our nervous systems and our brain's power gets turned inwards to do things like relax our blood vasculature relax the smooth muscles release all this tension our blood pressure decreases our heart rate decreases cortisol levels decrease you know and all of this healing potential just opens up from the inside it's an incredible incredible process 
Yeah, there's so many aspects to it. I'm really glad that you turned me on to the the book of floating by uh, Michael it. Hutchinson. <laughs> Sent me this book, and so about halfway through it, because it, it's I just want to take my time digesting it because it's just so dense uh, in a good way. It's easy to understand, but it's dense, and I like how each chapter it kind of breaks down because there's not just one uh, benefit of of floating. There's like multiple kind of, I guess, explanation of benefits that this book talks about. And like, like you just mentioned, the anti-gravity, but also talks about like the three brain explanation, which I was fascinated by uh, because I guess we have like these uh, different animal brains uh, in, our, in our head. Like one of my uh, friends, Robert Kassari, he would always lecture and say, you know, we, we have this aquatic stage and then we have a reptilian stage and it's, it's mammalian. <clears throat> and this book talks about the mammalian reptilian and then the neocortex kind of on top of those and how what floating does is it kind of integrates those three brains where they can kind of talk to each other or work together more harmoniously instead of just working separately on their own yes yeah and it's a fascinating process you know and not something we see too often in our typical waking state you know even we can go into like the brain waves and things like that as well uh like our, our normal waking state that me and you are in right now, we're in, we're in beta most of the time, right? Like our normal waking state. But what we see when we take like EEGs of Tibetan monks when they're in the peak of their meditative experiences, right? What we see is they're in this brainwave called beta, which I'm, I, know, I know you're super familiar with and a lot of your listeners as well. But uh, theta is incredibly powerful and not something most human beings really get to experience much of at all. Maybe it's like two to five seconds when you wake up uh, occasionally in the morning, uh, but quickly you snap out of it, the alarm gets out of it, whatever, whatever's going on around you. But uh, what we see is a delicate transition between beta to alpha to theta. And we're actually obtaining these deep theta brain waves during this float experience which is incredible because like you said, we have these three parts of our brain and we also have multiple hemispheres of our brain. And what we see is we get out of that left logic side of our brain that so much of us are in, especially as business owners, as business people working, 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 logic, left brain. And it's rare enough that we even engage that right brain much at all, unless we're doing some art, some music, whatever it is. Hopefully we all have practices that engage that right brain as well because it's very important. Uh, what we see in the float environment is it doesn't just transition us to that right hemisphere. Actually, there's a sort of synchronicity and harmony between the two hemispheres. And they both start vibrating in unison and communicating with each other. And when we do this, this is what results in that sensation and that feeling that a lot of athletes or musicians um, have coined the flow state, which we all try to tap into, you know, and it's a very powerful process when we can tap into that. And what we see is that life itself has a flow to it. You know, life has a flow. And when we can stop resisting and let go and tap into the flow of life, a deep stream of intuition opens up, you know. We're in tuned, we're aligned, we're clear with what we got to do and how to do it. You know, so simply opening up and synchronizing these two parts of your brain has a beautiful chain reaction that goes much, much deeper than the physical benefits, you know, it's about well-being. Yeah, the, my, my experience has been uh, quite emotional, which is interesting. I haven't cried or anything in the tank, but I think the first, <laughs> right, <laughs> I think the first couple times I, I, I messaged you and I said, I had these full body shakes. What's that about? And you said, Oh, Matt, those are hypnagogic uh, shakes. And th those should subside over time, I believe you said. But I'm still getting them. Like I floated last night and I do just 60 minutes, usually at night. And uh, yeah, I had a good strong five last night. Um, one time, my, my left arm just shot up in the air, just involuntary. <laughs> and, then, and then the other time my right arm shot out to the side involuntary. And then my whole body, full body shake. 
involuntary once again. <laughs> and it's like, where are these coming from? And it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, it's stored um, stress or trauma that was kind of stuck in my tissues or nervous system that didn't have a way to get out until that very moment in the tank. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah, definitely. And what we see, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny, funny you said the, the jumping, the flailing. I mean, it's a great defense mechanism if anyone tries to break in. Uh, yeah, the next stage is full-on levitation. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm just playing. But uh, yes, yeah, so what we see is, yeah, they will subside over time. Like you said, they are emotional blockages. Also, though, what it is, uh, or what it, it can also be, is your sympathetic nervous system deactivating and, sh and shifting into that parasympathetic state. You know, and when we do that, we feel that literal shift. It, it's a, like you feel it's abrupt. You feel it's a good shake. It's a good jolt. Uh, but that's literally your body kicking into that relaxation mode right away. And our body has a powerful, powerful relaxation mode. But we can kick that on. Uh, and the tank's a great way to facilitate that. But like you said, like there's times when I'm in the tank, man, and you're laying there. There's nothing going on nothing eliciting any of these emotions but when you release your muscle tension and the blood vasculature totally relaxes you know um what we see is is all this trauma stored in our muscles and our in our skeletal system as well you know so when we can totally let go totally relax just float and be our muscles release a lot of this subconscious trapped excess energy that a lot of times been trapped in there due to traumatic or emotional experiences, you know? Uh, so like maybe it's a heartbreak or something like that. And when you totally relax, you'll start feeling this energy flow in your heart chakra, that heart zone again, and start to get released. And the idea with this is, is we feel those emotions. We process them. We feel them to heal them. And that's kind of the philosophy. We feel it to heal it. But so often, man, I've been there, you know, like I'm a, I'm a martial artist at heart. I have been my whole life. And uh, so the first 18 years of my life or so was just taught. It was instilled in me like tough, tough, no pain, no emotion. You know, don't show that. Don't show that sign of weakness. And what I would do when I met a traumatic experience, we all know people like this, somber people, uh, stern they still, they feel these emotions, you know, they're landing somewhere. But what happens is we kind of shove them down and our muscles and our tissues hold on to them and try to suppress them. But when we can relax, let go, trust, let that energy flow again, we feel it to heal it. Um, and sometimes the purges come, you know, <laughs> sometimes those tears will come. I'm sure there'll be days where the tears start flowing for no reason, but that's good, man. We let that out. We're breathing it out. We're yawning it out when we're in the tank. All these emotional purges when we're in this environment are extremely therapeutic on our energetic body as well. It's fascinating stuff, man. I love that. Yeah, the breathing is um, really important because I think Joe Rogan kind of popularized float tanks and he has some interesting little YouTube rants on it. And uh, one of them I was watching, he was saying that your mind will basically go into this, will take you in a downward spiral when you get into the tank. You know, it's like all the stuff that happened that day, you know, I have to clean my office, all the stuff you have to do, but it's always about bringing it back to the breath. And that was, that's kind of a nice reminder for me yes. when I get into the tank to always remember that because I can just go off thinking about things I have to do or I did or regret or whatever <laughs> and just get lost in that. <laughs> but I'm not going to get anywhere. And that's, just the bottom line. Um, the only way I'm going to get anywhere is just by bringing my whole focus back to my breath. And what I found is I'll kind of have this shortness of breath. Like I'll be breathing just deep. And then it, it feels like every five minutes I have to take this big, huge inhale. Ah. <laughs> Has that been your experience or any thoughts on that? Yeah. It's in, <laughs> The breath is incredibly important and not just, not just during the float environment, 
You know, mm. like we say, our introspective abilities enhance tremendously when the external world is brought down to a minimum, you know? So what we see is yes, our awareness isn't as external, but there's still an awareness there and it goes very internal. So that's why this, this form of therapy is incredibly helpful and useful for anyone practicing any form of mindfulness, you know, um, or anyone that's working to develop a mindfulness practice, which a lot of anxious and um, depressed clients or patients are, are looking to do. It'd be very helpful to them to develop a practice of mindfulness all day long, not just in the tank. But what it does is when your awareness goes internal, we're so much more in tune and aware with the, the functions and the processes of our heart, of our lungs, or a digestive system, you know, and we realize we have a lot more control over these functions than we like to believe. Yes, our autonomic nervous system takes over, we kind of just get in the habit of like breathing all day long. But when we take a second, we fully open up our lungs, you know, a fascinating chain reaction takes place. So a lot of people, a lot of people don't recognize that if the human body had a manual, you know, I've been looking long and hard, I haven't found one yet, <laughs> but if it had one, it would absolutely say to breathe in through your nose 99% of the time, right? Our nose is literally a filter, you know, it's filtering our air, it's dehumidifying the air, it's cooling or heating the air, it's regulating the air before it goes into our lungs. And also something I like to focus on in the tank and out, is as I breathe the air in, the first two thirds of that breath should always, 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 even during the day, fill the stomach first and the last third chest and lungs. But what happens all day long, people fall in the trap of chest breathing, shallow breathing, mouth breathing. When we start mouth breathing, literally what that's sending the signal to our body is we're in a state of stress activate these stress hormones, activate these molecules. And it's a, a negative feedback loop, you know, when we go back to the breath, fill the lungs all the way, out all the way. It's a powerful, powerful way to uh, elicit that relaxation response as well. And just deepen that entire experience, especially the fluid experience. I love that. Yeah. I've always been a nose breather, but, uh, I, I learned, uh, it's so my girlfriend that I actually snore for a partial time during the night. Yeah. And so I, I discovered <clears throat> mouth taping and unfortunately it doesn't work with a beard. So I'm going to have to bite the bullet at some point and keep my face shaved <laughs> so the tape could stick. But I've heard from multiple people that it's like training wheels. And after maybe even a month, could take three months, you might not need the tape anymore. And that's, there's so many practices you can do. I feel like to stabilize the nervous system and, and I, you know, go more into that parasympathetic deep relaxation state and not, to, you know, not into brain hypoxia, which I guess happens when you snore at night, my understanding. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that yeah, man, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's like, <clears throat> like I said, I, even before I go in the tank, I like to uh, really focus on the breath before, mm -hmm. during the session. And you'll notice the breath is directly related to that muscle tension, that relaxation response. And the more you can let go, the more you can ah, really sigh into that breath and let it all out. A lot of energy is coming out with that. Uh, yeah, man, the way I look at it is like our lungs, similar to how our stomach, when it gets, uh, when we're hungry and our stomach shrinks, it releases the hormone ghrelin, right? So when our stomach is small, it releases ghrelin and we feel hungry, right? Our lungs are doing the same thing. You know, when our lungs aren't fully expanding, it's releasing these stress hormones. But much like our stomach, as soon as I fill it up, even if it's with water, the ghrelin starts being produced. Do we start settling down a little bit, a little less hangry? Uh, same with our lungs. When we take those full deep breaths, we open up that bottom quarter of our lungs as well. We kind of pressurize our lungs from the inside. Um, the relaxation response kicks in. You can get deep into that. It's powerful. Don't forget it. I love it. <laughs> and we kind of jumped right in and I should have asked you uh, just the basics because some people might have never seen these tanks. Just what is a sensory deprivation float tank uh, just summarized? Yeah. So float therapy, 
also known as sensory deprivation or restricted environmental stimulation therapy, or REST for short, is really a powerful wellness tool is the way I look at it, you know? And it's been taking the West Coast and Europe by storm this past decade or two. But uh, really, if, for, for people listening at home, what we can visualize is a big egg-shaped hot tub type pod with a lid over the top, right? Big egg, about the size of a small car. And inside that chamber, there's 10 inches of water that's super saturated with over a thousand pounds of therapeutic grade Epsom salt. And the benefits of Epsom salt alone have been well known and well documented for thousands of years, right? Uh, but what this solution does is since it's so super saturated, I could literally take a bowling ball, put it in the water, and it would float to the top like a cork, you know? So a human head, human body, no issue at all. Um, but yeah, bottom line, you get into the tank, close the lid, lie down, flick the light off, and this tank is deprived of all sensory information. It's a very unique environment. So in this chamber, there's no light because the chamber itself is actually light proof. So in a well calibrated flotation environment, not even a single photon of light is entering the, the user's vision at all. You know, there's no sound because not only is the tank sound resistant, but the user also has earplugs in. There's no smell, there's no taste, and there's no touch even, which is the most difficult one to get rid of uh, because the solution itself, along with the air inside the chamber, is precisely calibrated, heated and kept at a constant 94.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And this temperature is exactly the temperature of the external layer of your skin, making the solution skin receptor neutral, we call it. Meaning literally your brain, your body cannot feel anything at all, even the water itself. And as a result, really what happens in my experience is the user is oftentimes left with the sensation of not even really knowing where their body starts and the water begins, which is a fascinating experience uh, because I know for me, sometimes I feel like I merge with the water. Sometimes I feel like I merge with the tank. The boundaries and the construct of our ego subside since there's, no, there's no, uh, nowhere to anchor that belief anymore, right? I, I can't tell where my body is. I can't feel it. And with practice, what people can experience is actually uh, a samadhi experience or emerging with all that is but bottom line getting away from all the sensory overload into an environment like this is incredibly important and uh, the float tank's a great way to do that that was an awesome explanation and i like that you said uh, not even one photon of light enters the chamber because that is pretty much impossible <laughs> even when we're in bed i mean light from i don't know your humidifier or your air filter or even from the other room coming in or moonlight i think no matter where we are i mean it's it's really difficult to not have one photon and why that matters is our skin has as you probably know photoreceptors on it and mm -hmm. i believe neuropsin it's like a rec actually fairly recently discovered one and that does powerfully affect our nervous system, depending on the wavelength. And there's so many, uh, you know, contextual pieces there, but just to completely shut out, not one photon, as you said, I think that is a really important piece of why, you know, it's a combination of things, but that one is super important. <laughs> mm -hmm. Extremely. And like you say, we, we always get people, my favorite are the people that hit me up and ask like, Hey Max, like, like, why can't I just do that in my bathtub, <laughs> you know, uh, in many reasons, as you know, um, but like you said, I, I haven't yet found a bathtub that is large enough for me to just lay spread eagle in just yet. <laughs> if you find one, let me know. Uh, but again, like all of these different pieces, being able to lay there with no sensory information, not, not touching the sides or nothing like that, 
Uh, plus, I haven't even found a bathtub that I could put a thousand pounds of Epsom salt in that wouldn't fill three times over <laughs> before I'm done putting those a thousand pounds in. This is a lot of Epsom salt. This is not just one or two pounds of Epsom salt you might put in a foot soak or a, an Epsom salt bath at the end of the night. It's important to emphasize there's over a thousand pounds of this magical healing mineral, you know? So at the same time as you're laying there, your body's soaking up the magnesium through the hair follicles of your skin and it's getting absorbed directly into the bloodstream, you know? So, um, and I'm sure we'll dig into that further later on in the episode, but again, laying there, can't do that in our bathtub. The, that amount of Epsom salt simply would not fit in your bathtub. Uh, plus the water and air itself would have to be calibrated to that 94.5, which is very difficult to do, along with blocking out the light and blocking out the sound. So it's a lot easier to get into a tank and do it that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you touched on the magnesium because that's something that we didn't even talk about yet. And I've been talking about magnesium on YouTube and in public lectures and stuff for, I don't know, like eight years, six, seven, eight years, trying all different forms. And uh, I've always pointed people to the, the chloride form. But recently, I think because of you, you mentioned Dr. Mercola, and he wasn't able to raise his RBC magnesium, which stands for red blood cell, which is more accurate than serum. A lot of people think, oh, you can't measure magnesium accurately. You can. It's called RBC. It's like 30 bucks. Requestatest.com. And that made sense to me because I just meditate on magnesium pretty much every day. It's just fascinating to me because it's like a spark plug that's not only... 300 enzymes, but 3,700 enzymes. Mm. And we only have 9,000 that run the body. So that turns out to be 42% of our electrical body yes. is run by this mineral. And it regulates calcium. It's burned with stress. It's burned with iron overload. It's burned with calcification. <laughs> so many things use it up. And what I've seen is people are just taking, you know, a minuscule amount of a magnesium supplement and it's like pouring water in a plant with holes on the bottom, it's just going right through and it's not being, yes. it's not, the body's not holding on to it. And I think that's, you know, multiple reasons like calcification and lipo. I mean, there's so many there's, people are just oxidative stress to the max and just that burn rate concept of magnesium. A lot of people don't understand. They're just popping some pills and magnesium and oh, I'm good. But is it enough? I don't think so until you start doing multiple forms and, you know, perhaps floating regularly. I mean, if you really want to see that number change, right? Yeah, def definitely. And that's totally, totally overlooked in, that, in, in the health realm so often, you know, people don't realize that magnesium is the most abundant mineral in the human body, you know, very important for our elect uh, electrical functions. And I know a lot of people say, like, you know, like 300 enzymatic reactions, like you mentioned, man, so, so much more, so much more. Uh, over 4,000, and as our ability to really test that gets more fine-tuned, we're going to realize this mineral is a crucial element of life, you know, in our whole experience here. Um, and another important thing to note, people don't realize <clears throat> over 80% of Americans are magnesium deficient, you know, and that's a very generous number. Me and you both know that it's very unlikely that 20% of the, the American population is proficient in magnesium, especially since we're not even getting it. Even if I was just eating leafy green vegetables, I was vegan as could be, um, our, our plants just don't have optimal magnesium levels anymore. Our soils are very depleted from all the farming over and over and over. They don't have that content of magnesium in it any longer. So like you mentioned, so many people we're supplementing orally magnesium to make up for it. Naturally, it kind of makes sense, right? Like, hey, I'm low in magnesium. <laughs> Let, let's take some. But what people run to, they run to the mag oxide, which is only absorbed 4% bioavailably, you know, uh, or mag arspitate, which is highly toxic. So, and, and even if we do find a high quality magnesium supplement that we are supplementing regularly orally, what we see is no change in RBC magnesium levels, oftentimes for nine to 12 months after supplementation. 
So we have to recognize this is a, uh, a long-term supplement, something we have to get. But that's what brings me to floating is, again, we are in, when you're floating, you're in a very healing solution. There's a lot of very powerful minerals in that solution that are actually being absorbed through your skin. So we've actually taken pictures now in the laboratory of magnesium ions getting transdermally absorbed through the hair follicles of your skin directly into the bloodstream right away. And this is very, very important, very important because we don't have to wait nine to 12 months to, to notice any benefits from the magnesium. Our body has a fail safe that will suck magnesium in if we're deficient and cut it off when we're proficient, you know, so we don't got to worry about overdosing, taking these highly toxic amounts. Our body has a natural fail safe mechanism to absorb this magnesium naturally. And all we have to do is leverage it, you know. Um, and one other thing on that, a lot of people will run to, even if they aren't supplementing orally, like magnesium creams, lotions, you know. But as we dig into the literature, what we find is the magnesium isn't absorbed super easily. You know, it needs to be a very unique environment. You know, so not only does it have to be an, an extremely high concentration of magnesium, but it also has to be in a solution that is very warm, you know, over 90 degrees. And we have to be laying in there for over 45 minutes to get these benefits transdermally oftentimes. Um, so to me, uh, it's very similar to the environment we are in, <laughs> in the flotation thing. Uh, so what we see, like you had mentioned, is RBC magnesium levels begin to shoot up with more regular float floating. I like that you mentioned the 45 minutes thing, because I know a lot of people will do a magnesium bath and just do like 30 minutes, or 20 minutes. Mm. And uh, before I got the float tank, um, very fortunate to have that now, I was doing magnesium baths probably two to three times a week. And I would sometimes stay in there for hour and a half, two hours. And I think by that point, the water is getting lukewarm where I keep having to turn on the hot water to warm it up yeah. again. But that's where I really felt the benefits is getting to that like two hour mark. Um, but I mean, this is you know, 10 times, 100 times more <laughs> magnesium <laughs> in the float tank. Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to Morley Robbins because he's a regular guest on the show and he's known as like the magnesium man. He's been talking about it for years and years. And well, one of our first conversations on this show, uh, it was focused on magnesium and uh, yeah, I think just people overlook, uh, how much it, all of the things it controls, um, even to the heartbeat, like it controls the enzymes that, that regulate the heartbeat. So arrhythmias, you know, mm -hmm. it's just simply magnesium deficiency, but it even opens the, this is what, what's interesting in the context of floating it opens the file drawers in the hippocampus mm. and the hippocampus is that gland that holds memories, which brings me to my next, next point. That's this blew my mind. I was not expecting this with your tank. Things that I haven't thought about in five years, 10 years, memories of events that I didn't think bothered me. I think like maybe a girl I asked out that turned me down or gave me a fake number <laughs> <laughs> like just these random that consciously I don't care about. Like mm -hmm. I, I think back like in the tank, I'm like, I don't feel, <laughs> but it's obviously the memories were coming up. Mm -hmm. So I, they were suppressed and that makes me wonder. I mean, it must've been this combination of, you know, maybe the magnesium helping my hippocampus access those, those memories and just the, the perfect environment to access them. And yeah, I mean, this happens almost every float where I'll, I'll remember something that I forgot mm -hmm. that I didn't know that I just suppressed and stored. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And it's so common, so incredibly common. Uh, like I said, that we do, we feel something, we try to tough it out. We kind of just bury it. But there's a quote, my man, Paul check says, he says, uh, emotions buried alive, never die. You know, and, and it causes a lot of trauma, a lot of disease long term when we hold on to these things in our in our system. So it's very important to relax, get back to that baseline and feel it, heal it, let it out, breathe it out, yawn it out, you know, purge it out. 
Um, yeah, very powerful, very important. Yeah, I feel a lot lighter. I've been averaging a float a night, uh, I'd say, you know, five days a week at least. Um, I'll take a night off here and there. And I guess people ask me all the time, what's the biggest benefit you've noticed from floating? And I would just say very simply, I feel lighter. Um, just like I'm not holding on to as much. And I think that translates too to, to less neck tension, um, just less tension overall. I'm not as, as rigid in my just physicality. Mm -hmm. And just a lower, I think as you call it, lower baseline stress level. Like that bar has been lowered and it's just priceless. I mean, because I, I make better decisions. I can memorize things easier. Um, I don't fly off the handle when, you know, someone's mean to me or whatever. I just walk away from drama. Just even in the last couple months, just so many changes I've made uh, just from lowering that baseline. It's pretty awesome. Yes. I love to hear that, man. And I, I can totally relate there, you know. And for me as well, there's so so many ways that floating's really changed my life. Um, the way I got into floating originally, so I, like I mentioned, I'm a lifelong martial artist, you know. And my parents originally got me into martial arts when I was just four years old, so literally lifelong. And they were hoping at the time that the martial arts would help with a degenerative neuromuscular disease I was born with called Charcot Marie Tooth or CMT. So they were looking for something to help with like my muscle strength, balance and coordination, really. So it was either martial arts or ballet, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so thankfully it was martial arts and thankfully I stuck with it because it became a huge part of my life, as you know. But as I got older and started teaching and competing more, I was constantly looking for ways to optimize my mind and body, much like yourself. My perspective is um, very closely related to yours, you know, kind of blending that ancestral wisdom with uh, the modern science and uh, making the best of both worlds. But one time uh, I accepted a bout, a competition against a very tough opponent, MMA, so in the, in the octagon. And at this stage of my life, I was about 17. And as soon as you accept a bout, there's an, an eight to 10 week span of grueling, grueling training, you know, getting my ass kicked a lot more than I would have liked <laughs> uh, for every day, eight to 10 hour days, you know, so long, long days, while at the same time having that huge stressor of this big event, big, I was putting on a pedestal at the time, you know, but like, hey, I'm my family name's on the line, my, my team name's on the line, you know, I'm going to be going in there literally to battle while at the same time, the stressor of trying to cut 35 to 45 pounds in that last month before that event. So mentally I was in a hole, man. I was not feeling good physically. I was fatigued and quite literally malnourished <laughs> in every way, <laughs> you know? So I was very stressed out. My nervous system was in a lot of angst and stress and I was grasping and looking for something to help me dig me out of this hole, you know? And I was in the locker room one time, one of my buddies had mentioned how he just tried floating and I heard him talking about it. I was like, sounds weird, but try anything once, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I went down the next day, booked a session. And as soon as I got out of that tank, bro, I was instantly hooked, instantly. I remember getting out and I had, even at that time in my life where I was extremely stressed, this intense buzz of relaxation, peace, and just pure serenity that I had never experienced before in my entire life, especially at a point like this, you know? And um, I just couldn't help but think, man, like there's so many stressed people out there. If If only floating was more easily accessible to more people, um, the world would be a better place. So I made it my mission right there, make floating more easily accessible to a wider audience. And um, ultimately that's where my passion for float therapy started and brings us here today, dog. I love it. <laughs> yeah. That buzz of peace and serenity that describes it perfectly. That's the cool thing about floating is there are long-term benefits, but there are immediate benefits and I still remember my first float like you, where 
I went to Costco afterwards. Uh, <laughs> it was, I think, when people were getting off work. And so I went right from floating into Costco. We all know how, and this is, you know, pre COVID, so it was a little less crazy, but still, and, you know, there's people rushing past me with carts. And I just felt like I was still floating, like over the ground in Costco. <laughs> like I was just like gliding along the Costco floor. And I just remember being so grounded. And um, again, that's when I was malnourished. I think I was vegan at the time, fruitarian or something. You know, not eating any animal protein, not nourishing my nervous system with metabolic foods or whatever. And yeah, I'll never forget that feeling. And and what's cool is I notice that that gets more and more locked in the more consistent consistently I float. Um, I wanted to ask you too. This is kind of random, but in this the book of floating, one of my favorite parts I've read so far, and this is really wild. This is like mind over matter stuff but it talks about <clears throat> experiments that have been done with people sitting on the couch <laughs> imagining lifting weights and physically gaining muscle and then same thing with like practicing a golf swing just the power of visualization but i think the book made the point that doing that in the tank is like the accelerated not to say you know be a couch potato and just be sedentary <laughs> but i think there's something I mean, I've heard multiple stories, I think even Adam Bergstrom have had on the show, of just that power of the mind um, can do a lot. I mean, it's, if you want to make it practical, I mean, with reversing disease, I guess you could say. Yeah. <laughs> and, dude, it's, it's really incredible. The studies have been coming out that have been coming out. There was recently one done on the Washington State basketball team in regards to visualization in the float tank when they had took control group and they had them practice an hour a day shooting free throws on the actual court and they had the other control group uh, laying there in the float tank for one hour each day visualizing themselves taking that same exact free throw and what we see again the power of visualization is very important so our brain cannot tell a difference you know so we can visualize something and our bodies feels as if it's actually occurring but when we visualize, we're hyper aware, hyper mindful of everything going on because we're in control of it. So you're really focusing on how you're gripping the ball, where your hands are, you know, like how much backspin you're putting on it, how it feels, how it feels. And we can start uh, at the same time linking in the powerful emotions of like, oh, that one landed like nice. And we feel the success. We, we start building that internal confidence inside, which can't go, can't get overlooked either. And also the power of these mental reps with whatever it is, whether we're getting ready for a podcast, whether we're getting ready for a big game, these mental reps, getting them in. I know I use it a lot for martial arts. I just, I'll visualize techniques in my head and I'll, I'll be working them in the tank and I'll really visualizing them uh, and breaking them down. So it's, it's really powerful. It's awesome. Yeah. I just finished a book, uh, a luminous life by Jacob, Jacob Lieberman like an advanced mm -hmm. ophthalmologist guy really into eye health and light. And there was a part of the book where it talked about um, this, this, this guy was shining a light in someone's eyes and um, had the person visualize, I think making successful golf swings where they made it in the hole. And he was literally calling out like each time the guy like in his head won just from looking in his eyes wow. so it's 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 interesting like our body how how it works and how it all connects mm -hmm. uh it's it's always fascinating to me yeah definitely definitely is they've done some what some wild experience wild studies with that um yeah it's a powerful mechanism there was another one too where they took some people uh that are meditating together like kind of going back to the power of meditation so when you're meditating in a group together with another individual, uh, there's this deep connection with your brains and they start kind of uh, mirroring each other, you know? And then later at the end of the six week meditation session, they took those clients and put them in different towns, like 50 miles apart. And they took a light and shined it in the eyes of one of those meditation participants. And the other one knew right away when the light flashed, like they, they felt the flash as well at the same time. 
uh, wow. yeah, just a little little tidbit there, but I thought that was fascinating too. <laughs> That'd be that's awesome. Yeah, I've been diving back into um, uh, magnetism uh, research, just like obsessed for the last week, getting back into earthing and grounding. Yes. And uh, this one guy I was listening to on Patrick Timpone's podcast was saying. Um, Jerry Jacobson, I think his name was, he was saying chemi- biochemical reactions are short range and electromagnetic uh, uh, reactions are long range. And he was talking about like the power of love in that context. And that explains like telepathy and connection between two people that love each other and, mm-hmm. you know, family, romantic relationship, whatever it is. Just that it's that uh, long distance thing. I mean, it's very scientific yeah <laughs> it's real like you said we, we even see too um like the deeper you get and once you start making flotation a real practice and something that you're doing regularly there's really no limits to how deep you can go man as, as i'm sure you're seeing you know you just keep peeling more layers of the onion off each breath i'm in the tank and i'll, I'll breathe out <sighs> and i'll be like wow th- this is the most relaxed i've ever been in my life and then the next breath 30 seconds later i take another one <sighs> And I, I drop deeper and deeper and deeper. But that's an infinite hole uh, of relaxation and serenity we can keep dropping down into, you know. And when we do, it opens up the realms for, for all sorts of things, whether it's visualization, whether it's astral projection, remote viewing. All these things can be done very effectively and a lot more easily inside an environment like that. Yeah, I've definitely had moments in the tank where I'm like, I, f- I feel like I'm spinning. And so I think my physical body would respond by, <laughs> by like moving. But just because you can't see anything, you can't feel anything, you could feel like you're doing a full spin in the tank where you're completely still mm-hmm. physically, right? The mind can do some wild things in there because there's no reference no, point. <laughs> not one. <laughs> it's looking desperately and not finding one. <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah, that was another explanation. This book I like is like that people are like, don't you get bored in there? But it's just your 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 system's looking for any stimulus, and it infinitely cannot find one. So it just keeps going deeper and deeper. Like where you're saying you're tapping into, you know, feeling your heartbeat and the blood (laughs) through your veins, and it'll it'll find something right? But it'll be really deep. It won't be external. Yes. Very deep and very, like I said, like we said, limitless, but we can now, that's why it's very important as well. Whenever we're doing anything, but especially floating, meditating, setting that intention for what we're looking to get out of that experience, you know? So sometimes I'll go in, just breathe and I'll set my intention, uh, open up my heart. And I say, open up my heart, heal my deep subconscious, you know, help release any of the fears I have, whatever's going on. But I set that intention. And then, like we said, there's nothing external to focus on, but our body and our consciousness and our awareness focuses on these tasks that it feels it needs to do. So when we're in there, yeah, there's not a lot to do, not a lot to think about, you know, but when we can kind of direct with the flow, Uh, not being too tense about it, but kind of just subconsciously directing the purpose and the mission of that experience to be something that's therapeutic, to be something that's healing. Like sometimes I'll go in and I'll have a pain in like my, my knee or whatever it is. And I'll just kind of focus the awareness down in my knee and I'll really start to feel some deep energetic subconscious healing take place. We need to recognize a lot of times we look external for all these different tools, all these different supplements, but our bodies have a natural innate ability to heal whatever's thrown at it, you know? And when we relax and trust and open up to that process, we can allow that healing to really take place. I love that. (laughs) And there's a, there's a good segue because you introduced me to the idea of a passive versus an active float. And I still haven't done an active one, but um, that it's my understanding that means having uh, music playing or something that you want to speed learn, like a lecture or something. Whereas passive is just no sound, nothing, right? And 
is that pretty 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 accurate spot on <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the way, the way i break it down is we either have when we enter the tank again we can go totally passive which is awesome you know very powerful which would be passive would be like again no light because there is a light in our chambers you know we have a multicolored led light in there which has benefits as well chromotherapy benefits so if i'm working with a client again the light is very healing as well when leveraged properly so if there's different emotional issues they got going on certain frequencies of light can help them tap into that and elicit those certain biochemical reactions but uh a passive float would have none of that just think silence you're dropping into the silence you're dropping into the darkness you're dropping into the stillness and you're just sitting there and experiencing what it feels like to just be for an hour, two hours, however long you want to stay in there, where an active float is on the other end of the spectrum, where we can leverage things like uh, certain powerful frequencies, you know, because our, our tanks have powerful sound transducers that actually vibrate and permeate different healing frequencies, whatever you want, and just hooks up to your phone. You put your phone in, you can put any song, healing frequencies, guided meditations, hypnosis tracks. And there's been a lot of fascinating studies on how much more easily susceptible you are to hypnosis when in the float environment as well. It's very powerful. Uh, so again, guided meditations, hypnosis tracks, astral projections, whatever we want to do, that would be more active. But an interesting realm pathway uh, where I see the float world kind of churning these next few years is we recently partnered up, Serenity Floats, partnered up with a uh, VR company, a waterproof, saltproof VR company, where what we're doing is taking VR goggles into the flotation tank as well. And this would be a totally different experience, man. You know, but now we, what we can do is we can just put a clip of like my ideal golf swing or my ideal free throw shot, whatever it is. And now without any other sensory input, our brains can hyper focus on whatever's in front of it. You know, so we see people like Navy SEALs have been leveraging the float tank for many, many years now to learn languages instead of in six months, learning them in just six weeks, you know, so a fraction of the time. But this really is a hyper learning environment. You know, when we can focus all of our brain power onto one task, like we've mentioned so many times, the power of our mind is truly infinite and limitless. And being able to harness that inside a unique environment like this is very important. Awesome. Yeah, I've been using, uh, I think every float, the uh, pink noise ultrasonic generator. And I think it makes a maybe a small frequency noise, but I, I can't notice it when I'm in the tank. And uh, Patrick Flanagan designed that to be an accelerated learning tool, like synchronizes the brain hemispheres and does a lot. So that's been kind of cool to bring the dolphin frequencies in there. But I want to experiment with a few different things, but I also am aware that I don't want to get into that space that a lot of people get into where it's like, oh, how can I improve this? Like, I think it's already perfect. It doesn't need anything else. <laughs> but... Maybe, you know, experimenting with different things and even pre-float supplementation, uh, been messing around with, it. whether it's GABA or CBD or something. And, uh, that's always, always fun. Yeah. So, um, which, which pre-float, pre-float rituals have you been enjoying the most? Uh, lately, I told you before we started recording the prescriptions product, I think I could say it's their next one it's like an anti-anxiety uh trochee which is like cbd cbg gaba and kava nice. and uh i've also uh experimented with just uh cbd inhalation <laughs> cannabidiol <laughs> and just that that thing to kind of relax my nervous system i think that's you know more than like mind altering substances i think it's more useful, at least for me, to focus on just more grounding things um, just to help my my body relax. Mm -hmm. And I found all those things to really help 
because uh, my goal right now is not to <laughs> astral project in their remote view or anything like that. I just I know there's so many layers to get through of just memories and traumas that are just stored in there. So who knows how long that'll take? Hopefully not a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the journey. Quite the journey. Yeah, pe people always ask like, how often should I float? You know, mm -hmm. always asking this. Um, and I always like to say, like, if it is for an injury or something more um, emergent and more immediate, as many times as we can that first week or two, very important, you know. But if we're looking to do something like just unplug and disconnect or reset that baseline midday, use it as like a, a shotgun formula for a, a deep meditation, really, really is no wrong time to do it, you know. Uh, so I would just like to say the best time of day to float is the time you'll actually do it, you know, <laughs> you know, because uh, it benefits no matter when we when we decide to go in there. When have, when have you been floating? You just answered one of the questions. That's okay. awesome. Um, I've actually been floating only at night. I know you told me to do a a daytime float or a morning float um, or even middle of the night. I think you mentioned setting an alarm at like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. and going out and doing that. I think it'll be a lot easier once it's in my home because right now it's kind of connected in a little outdoor, semi-outdoor area. So my next spot I know will be ideal. Um, those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm moving soon. <laughs> but um, I get a little cold therapy in there because I have to go outside and around. Quite cold. <laughs> Quite frigid. <laughs> yep. You were up here. You felt it. Um, it's warming up though. But but yeah, let's jump into the questions, Max, because um, you already answered, I think, two or three. Um, one of my friends actually asked a funny one. Have they heard of the Bacta tank from Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have much experience with the Bacta tank. I have seen some pictures, though. <laughs> uh, dude, it's, it's fascinating because when flotation was just emerging in the 1950s, the mid-1900s, this man named John C. Lilly, he was kind of the pioneer of it, a fascinating fellow, as you know. When really at the time, there was a big debate among physicists, even philosophers of like, what makes human beings conscious and aware, you know, like, like what happens if, and, and really the philosophy was, the question was, if we were to take away and cut out all sensory input, what would happen to a human being? And actually at the time, not, not even that long ago, 70 years Many of the physicists believe that the only reason we were alive and aware was because our brain was being lit up with sensory information. So they theorized that if we were to cut out all sensory information, that the user would really just end up in like a comatose brain dead like state and nothing would be going on. So one man, John C. Lilly, great cat, uh, ended up testing that out. And he designed an environment, the flotation tank, where um, you, get, you cut out all that sensory information, you know, and he wanted to see what happened when we go in an environment like this. But his tank, the first float tank model ever, looked eerily similar to the back to tank. <laughs> like actually for a long time, probably like maybe, maybe 20 years, that was the float tank, you know, until we realized, hey, like, this isn't super convenient, <laughs> you know, those of you who don't know the back to tank, you're kind of in this um, seven foot tall chamber. It looks like a cryotherapy chamber, like a tube. You kind of pop in from the top with an oxygen mask on. You're getting supported by all these beams. You're just kind of levitating there. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't super inviting to many patients. <laughs> so we tweaked the design a little bit. And we continue to, but yeah, the back to tank is quite the tool. <laughs> yeah i think you had me dive more into john c lily stuff because i had heard about him years ago and uh there was a, a dolphin connection which i've always like been fascinated with dolphins and um i found this documentary that's on my list to watch 2014 documentary called the girl who talked to dolphins and i guess they pretty much locked up this woman with dolphins for like months. <laughs> and the goal was to get them to 
communicate with each other so they could understand each other. Um, yeah, the synopsis here, a scientist tries to teach a dolphin named Peter to understand and mimic human speech. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because John C. Lilly, he was trying to communicate with the dolphins, right? He was in his sensory tank and then there were dolphins mm -hmm. below or something like that. Yeah, he, he basically went to a dolphin sanctuary and set up a flotation chamber above the pool of dolphins and he would go in and what he'd work on was literally with the focus of trying to decipher, observe, and comprehend what the dolphins were saying to each other. And eventually uh, he got so proficient at this and understanding uh, the frequencies that the dolphins were emitting that he ended up uh, beginning to communicate with them himself, which is a fascinating thing. But at the time, again, <clears throat> when we're in the float tank, we're hyper aware, we're hypersensitive. We have a deep intuition that can connect with all things, not just other species. It goes far beyond telepathy, you know, uh, but also with animals. And, and the limits of this are uh, profound. But he also mixed in a couple substances, maybe a little, a little psilocybin, <laughs> maybe a little ketamine. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, so for that reason, he was kind of shunned from the scientific community for a little bit. But uh, the work he did was, was profound. He made many strides in many different realms, including human consciousness. And when he did discover that tank and he tried it out on himself, again, a lot of people theorized the brain would uh, go brain dead. You know, you kind of just shut off. But what they found with the EEGs was that your brain actually lights up like a Christmas tree when you're inside an environment like this. So a lot of parts of our brain settle down, dim out, you know, because again, there's no light. So the whole posterior sector of our brain, that's primary function is to just sort through and dissect photons of light and project out our external world, that visual cortex, big swath of brain tissue, totally gets to dim out and relax, you know? Not just that, our auditory cortex, this whole part of our brain, there's no sound waves to dissect so that part totally gets dim out as well. There's no movement inside the tank. There's no, there's no speech inside the tank. So these parts of our brain that we're constantly um, engaging get to dim out, quiet down as well. There's no smell inside the tank. So that part of our brain, there's no taste. That can calm down as well. So we start going down. If I had a diagram of the brain, I was doing little X's, you would see... Uh, uh, 90% of the brain is dimmed out inside this environment. Even, even the parts, again, related to touch. Um, but one of the most important aspects that often, oftentimes is overlooked is, yes, all parts, all parts of our brain um, settle down. But the base of our brainstem, right, our brainstem, our spinal cord, which is constantly fighting gravity, it's to also take a rest as well, right? So all these parts of our brain relax. We see our amygdala, that fight or flight center of our brain. And a lot of the studies in the EEGs, what we see is the amygdala totally dims out during a flotation session, right? Even more dim than what we'll see, uh, like anti-anxiety medications, top ones, benzodiazepines, Xanax, the effect on the amygdala, which is what these chemicals are aiming to do, is not only more profound inside the float tank, but it also lasts a lot longer. The benzos and the Xanax have a half-life of four to six hours, where in the flotation tank, we see the amygdala shut off, dim out, and the anti-anxiety effects of that float tank linger for anywhere from 20 to 36 hours post-float. Um, and again, this doesn't require any medications, it doesn't require any chemicals. This is very natural. You go into an environment, the amygdala shuts down, these parts of our brain shut down, and you naturally will feel better. I feel a lot of people would benefit from that. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, someone asked, can it be dangerous to float and fall asleep? 
this is kind of in the same vein of what you were just saying, because I've gone in there underslept and you've told me before that it's, uh, there are some people that have said that one hour floating is equivalent to, was it three or four hours of deep sleep? Yeah, it's, it's, it's great marketing. <laughs> I see so many companies <laughs> pumping out. Uh, hey, as my, as my understanding of deep, uh, as my understanding of sleep has deepened, I, I don't claim it as much, but there, there is some truth to it. Uh, it is replacing multiple sleep cycles, even just an hour in the tank, you know, where you're going very, very deep inside the chamber. But now it's def definitely not dangerous to fall asleep inside the float tank. Uh, your brain isn't going to shut off for good or anything like that. Um, and, I, and oftentimes that will happen naturally. You know, sometimes you go in and you'll, you'll stay in a deep meditative visualization type state. Uh, or sometimes you'll go a little more unconscious. And, and that's cool, too. But regardless of what you're doing inside that tank, the healing is happening naturally. Yeah, I've felt that I can't fall asleep in there. And uh, I think that's what it said in the book of floating. It's like you would think that you would just take a nap, but you're kind of going to a state of hyper awareness, right? Even if your brain's fatigued, you're underslept. I mean, that's been my mm -hmm. experience. It's hyper awareness, but it's relaxation at the same time it's yeah interesting yeah and that's the thing we see so many uh sensory disorders you know even even we look at things like autism or uh disorders on the spectrum we see these sensory sensitivity disorders and this is because we need to recognize i remember at the beginning of the episode you had mentioned like yo so much of our time is spent on our phones now like so much of our time and if we were to talk about this even just 15 years ago, you know, uh, I was a wee little one, but if we were to have a discussion like that, uh, most people would not believe if I told you like, Hey, in 15 years, 10 years, 40 hours of your work week, oftentimes a lot more is going to be spent on this little screen a foot in front of your face, you know? Um, and people don't, people don't realize the stress that puts on our entire nervous system. It's a huge stressor. And we need to realize we are the guinea pig generation for all of these technologies. And the literature is out. The science is out. We know that these are massive stressors to our brain and to our nervous system. And there's no, no wonder why suicides are on the rise. There's no wonder why there's over 40 million Americans in the U.S. alone over the age of 18, 40 million that suffer from chronic and severe anxiety. And more than half of these people aren't, aren't receiving any, any interventions at all. They have no outlets. You know, so that's tens of millions of Americans left on, the, on their own to battle their own internal demons. That's a difficult battle. So we need more outlets. We need more interventions. And uh, it's, it's my, my philosophy that, again, that if someone needs to take a, a, a mix of chemicals or a pill like that, because it's going to prevent them from like a, a death or anything like that. Absolutely. You know, but these are short term interventions for looking for something long term, natural, without the side effects. We should be steering people um, towards just simply unplugging a little bit first, getting back down to that baseline and figuring out what that root cause is uh, at the root of it all. That's awesome. Yeah, my prescription would be float tank plus face to face human interaction. You know, with the body language and the eye contact and the touching. That's so important. Um, I read a lot of interesting books just talking about that mm -hmm. aspect of how important that is for heart rate variability and just so many functions of the body. Like, that's a human requirement. <laughs> and uh, for a lot of people, just with the current, you know, situation the world's in and um, just this digital kind of push. Um, we've just been kind of pushed on our own, you know, inside, kind of secluded away from people. And I think that's just fueling the fire of a sensory overload, right? Yeah. So I just, if you do both, I find that's been really beneficial for me is the float tank plus that human yeah. contact. In like you had mentioned, that's so incredibly important. 
we need this. But a lot of people, again, I, I recognize it's called social media, but it, it's ironic that all of these social medias are making us infinitely less social. You know, and I'm really concerned about, especially the younger generations. Like I work with a lot of kids, teaching them martial arts and uh, getting them into the float tanks as well. It's very important. When we see a huge change, they light up when they get out of these tanks, when they light out, get out of these healing chambers, you know, they're, they're kind of re-sparked with an energy, with an, a, a vigor and enthusiasm for life um, that a lot of people haven't experienced in a long time. They've been dulled out. Our brains are getting dulled. We talk about um, like dopamine addictions or, or uh, dopamine fasts or things like this, but it's very important to cut out, unplug, our bodies are truly a battery, you know? We need our sunlight, we need our water, we need our clean air, we need to ground, we need to earth. These are very important. But it's also very important to get back to that baseline, unplug, disconnect, and then reboot, reset. When we reset, full of energy, full of life, we're ready to rumble. I love it. <laughs> These are good ones. Uh, had anxiety during first float. Um, recommenders, recommendations to keep myself calm. Uh, how to deal with anxiety and panicking in the tank. And I noticed I would get this just feeling, just waves of, and you, and you warned me about this. <laughs> you said your mind will think of a million reasons to get out. Right? And that's why you put a vent in your tank, yeah. right? So you're not, you know, you know you're not going to suffocate or, um, what I've noticed is, and I haven't done it once yet, but I'll get to a place where maybe it's boredom, but on my hour float, it feels like about 30, 40 minutes in. I'm like, okay, I think that's enough, but my timer uh, didn't go off. And I'm like, okay, if the timer didn't go off, I'm not getting out. And I've set that intention mm. with every float and I still haven't broken. I don't see myself doing it, but you your brain will try to create excuses, right? To get out of there. And that it does excuses. It will make, <laughs> you know, and, and we don't realize it's, it's, it's actually funny. Uh, and actually very important to be mindful of this process. Cause this is happening all day, all day, every day throughout our entire life. Our brain is, is the greatest problem solver or, or so it likes to think, you know, uh, really that's our heart. But we're constantly living out of our head. So many people, we go out into the everyday world and we're living out of here, you know, thinking, 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 observing. But really, the greatest journey of them all is the 17 inches from your brain down to your heart, you know? That's why when I'm in the tank, a lot of times I focus that awareness to my heart center. And I really want to open that up, open up that heart center, get out of the, the monkey mind you know, open up that heart. And what we do, we're connected with that intuition, connected with that clarity, that purpose, that alignment with what we have to do in the external world and we can go out and actually do it, you know? So for anyone struggling with anxiety inside the tank, it's always important to note, like, hey, there's not a padlock on the outside. <laughs> you know, you can get out at any time if you want to. All you do is you, put, you pop the lid open, you get out. Some people will crack the lid. You can flick the light on. Uh, so... It's important to note that if anyone's looking to try out floating, there are many options. You are in full control of your entire experience. You know, it's unique to you. You do whatever you want. Light on, crack it open, some music, uh, some jams, whatever you want to do. Uh, it's all on you. No pressure, no anxiety, but you focus on that breath. You relax, you let go, and you cultivate those, those positive emotions, the gratitude the love and you let that flow and you let that flow. And as we put that out into the world and we put that out into the universe, the universe will reciprocate and send that back to us. You know, we'll see that in the events in our life. We'll see that in our relationships. Um, it's a powerful thing. I think you mentioned too, if you can just sit with the discomfort for a little while, usually it doesn't last as long as you think and you'll have that release. And I think I've mentioned a few of those experiences to you in my tank. And that's been my experience. It's like, okay, pretty uncomfortable right now. And then it just passes and then I feel better mm -hmm. and it's it. <laughs> so if someone could just know that going into it, 
Like, oh, if they're having a little anxiety or a panic attack, just like just breathing through it if they can. And it probably won't last as long yes. as they imagine. This too shall pass. And I'll say to that too. And that's fascinating because I remember after one of my first floats, I observed this process. I was in there. <laughs> you know, you're, you're intimately connected with that monkey mind. And it just kept saying like, you got to get out of here, man. You got to get out, got to get out. It was doing everything it could to get me out of that environment, you know, because it, what it wanted me to do was just do certain things, different tasks. You're, there's a fascinating study where we took people uh, and put them in a room to sit and just think for 15 minutes. And the amount of resistance that we see with this study is incredible. And what we see is m many people, many of those participants actually preferred to administer electric shocks to themselves to simply avoid sitting there with themselves. You know, and this is a big issue. This is a big issue. So people would rather do something rather than nothing, even if the, the something was negative. And we do this all day long. Or we're constantly, we all know those people, we do it too. We're running from task to task to task, just trying to, to desperately cover this feeling of angst and anxiety inside of like, hey man, I, I don't feel great. <laughs> I'm gonna distract myself with that, that and the laundry and the dishes and all these things, you know, but we can get in the tank, ah, come to one with that feeling, heal that feeling, send the love to it, send the light to it, come out, you're glowing the rest of the day. It's a great feeling. You can take it slow, take it easy, and just flow. That's awesome. Yeah, well, part of the reason why I got the tank was to just feel more productive. And I'm sure you're aware of that saying, uh, if you don't have time to meditate for 20 minutes, meditate for an hour <laughs> or something like that. Love it. <laughs> and I've just found like the more, I guess, coherent my brain gets, and, and the more balanced and that lower baseline stress, I do feel like I can get more done in the day. And I do feel just like I, it's like I have more hours in the day, even though I'm devoting an hour a day to floating. It's really interesting. Like those hours outside of that are so much more productive. Yes, definitely. And so people ask me well, when I like to float, you know, and that's why that exact reason is why I personally uh, put it in my schedule every day, a float in the morning, a morning float, because it is so incredibly important to me that I establish and set a baseline for the day right at the beginning of the day. So I've been working uh, with the shamanic group this past couple of years. My shaman always says, he says, don't be the flashlight, be the lighthouse. Okay. It's kind of how it relates to floating in my mind. So we set that baseline of peace, of stillness, right? When we're in that tank. And I mindfully make a little note of that. I'm like, okay, this is my baseline for the day. And now as I get out of the tank and go throughout my day, stuff will come up, you know? Things come up. Someone will say something, leave a comment, cut me off in traffic, whatever it is. And I'll notice, because I'm constantly checking in and seeing if I'm at that baseline, making sure I'm maintaining it, but I'll notice every once in a while, a fluctuation away from that baseline, a wiggle, you know? And what happens so often is we get fluctuations on fluctuations on fluctuations, and we're so incredibly disconnected from that baseline and we're operating from here now, instead of that calm, peaceful heart center, you know? And when we are on the path that we are on, Matt, of educating, leading by example, waking people up. Imagine if we're trying to wake someone up and spread some knowledge and say you're laying there in your bedroom and I walk in with a flashlight, right? And I come in with a flashlight, uh, trying to wake you up, trying to spread some knowledge, you know, and I'm flicking it in your face. You're like, get out of here, get out of here. You're annoying, right? You're annoying, you're irritating. People don't listen to that. That's what happens when we're operating from that fluctuation. But when we drop to that baseline, maintain that baseline throughout the day, we're more accessible, we're more productive, 
we're full of love, we're full of light. And that is when our light is shining the, the most radiantly. So instead of being a flashlight, we want to be that lighthouse. And that lighthouse ability is when we're at that baseline, the lighthouse attracts people from the farthest depths of the ocean. You know, people are attracted to that lighthouse, that radiant lighthouse. Can't say no to the lighthouse. So we drop into that baseline at the beginning of the day. It's a few minutes. And if I notice a fluctuation, I'll take a few breaths. I'll do a little breath work. I'll get a float in, whatever. I'll go on a little walk. But it's very important to me to maintain that baseline. Because if I'm not doing something to the best of my ability, why even do it at all? If I'm not showing up in the world the way that I want to show up, if I'm not living impeccably, I do not want to show up as that person. I don't want to put that energy out there. You know, so this is very important. We set that baseline with a good old float in the morning and we go throughout the day uh, ready to rock and roll. I'm convinced I'm going to do my first uh, morning or early afternoon float. Uh, I haven't tested the light yet, but I think it should be pretty good. We, we, we set it up pretty well. You did a good job. Um, any tips for doing it for the first time? I would say, like you mentioned, stabilize yourself first because that took <laughs> me, I still bounce around. <laughs> and it's, I, I wonder if that's part of my mind distracting me. I've, I've like thought that. Like, am I unconsciously bobbing around the tank and knocking into the side? And you just always said, like, you know, take 30 seconds, right? Stabilize mm -hmm. yourself. So I'll do an extra minute or two on my timer before mm -hmm. I crawl in there just to give time yeah. to stabilize. Yeah, it's important. It's important, you know? Uh, and oftentimes we do subconsciously, we do get a little wiggle. We want a little movement. We want, we want some sensory information. Our brains are, uh, throthing for it always, you know? Uh, so oftentimes we do see that. Plus I'm sure all those hypnagogic jerks get you moving around a little bit, <laughs> uh, but those will begin to subside as well. But yeah. First time, just no expectations. Let go, relax. Focus on the breath. I know people like, uh, like our friend Joe Rogan. He'll always, sometimes he he gets deep, you know. <laughs> he he really sells it. Uh, and again, not that we cannot have wild psychedelic like experiences inside the chamber, because I'm sure you you and myself both have. Um, but don't go with any of those expectations, you know. Just go in the expectation of disconnecting. Unplugging, finding that baseline, opening up your heart, breathing, relaxing, releasing the muscle tension. Oftentimes I'll go through a little checklist, like my legs, my core, making sure it's all relaxed, my throat, the muscles in my face, my jaw. I want to make sure I'm relaxed as possible, really letting my head relax all the way back. A lot of times, first time people, they're worried about their head falling under, so they hold subconscious tension in their neck, you know? So if that's an issue, you put a little halo float pillow under it. There's a little, a little noodle that goes around your head, a little extra support if you need, but the solution's uh, incredibly buoyant. There's no drowning. Um, your head's not going to fall under, <laughs> you know? Um, and again, you're, you're in full control, so no angst. If you want to get out, if you want to flick the light on, do your thing. Um, yeah, first time people, I always just recommend no caffeine before, none of that. Uh, I'm a incredibly slow coffee oxidizer, so I, I, I'm I'm literally <laughs> jumping around in there. <laughs> I know you you probably take a couple shots of espresso before, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, I usually just recommend no caffeine um, at least four hours before. And yes, go in, relax, have fun, enjoy, and experience what it feels like to just be, just be. Love it, and I would say. Don't jump immediately to THC acid or mushrooms. <laughs> I think a lot of people will probably go into float centers on something. I mean, I'm sure float center owners have seen people in all sorts of different states. It's like you don't like you're going to have a mind altering experience on a substance or not, whether you have a float mm -hmm. tank, right? <laughs> and, and like you said, it's important to recognize everything's a medicine, you know, can be mm -hmm. proper dose. But silence itself is one of the most powerful medicines on earth. Dropping into the silence, dropping into the stillness, dropping into the darkness is a medicine. Learn that medicine. For, 
learn that medicine first. And then if you want to stack, if you want to add and, and feel a synergy between these different medicines, uh, you can experiment, do your thing. Uh, play it safe, start low, because again, you are hyper aware inside the tank, <laughs> you know, but I always recommend sober floats, sober floats. Um, and the deeper you get with that, again, you could take, spend a lifetime on sober floats and continue to get deeper and deeper and right to the center of that cycle. So enjoy the journey. Awesome. Um, someone asked, can you overdo floating or someone else max times you can float per week? I think you've said, what was your record? Eight <laughs> hours in the tank? <laughs> uh, I'm always trying to beat it. But uh, right now I believe it stands 1320. 1320. Yes, yeah, wow. so that was a, a full experience. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've had many overnight floats. Um, like I had, I had warned you, once you get a chamber at your crib, it has the potential to quickly become your bed. <laughs> you know, uh, so that's always a threat. But no, no, no overdoing floating. You know, really, the only people that I would be slightly concerned with would be if you have any sort of kidney diseases. You know, I always like to consult with your primary physician and just discuss uh, before too much because there's a heavy detox that comes with floating. I just want to make sure the kidneys are able to handle that. Uh, but yeah, man, I, like I said, this is something that's a maintenance therapy and a practice, especially for high performers. It's very important you float uh, regularly and often, you know, like every day is amazing as often as possible. There are people that will float once or twice a month and that's cool and you'll still reap amazing benefits, but for high performers as regularly as possible. Yeah, because a few people were asking about um, athletic recovery or recovery from workouts. Um, and that's really your specialty, right? Being in, in your, uh, your field. Um, what is it? Jiu-jitsu? Muay Thai? Yeah, I love yeah, uh, it. <laughs> we got it all, but I, I love the Muay Thai. <laughs> I, uh, I'm teaching and training a lot of Muay Thai, a lot of Jiu-Jitsu, a lot of self-defense. And I love mixing it all together for the, the mixed martial arts as well. So I love all the martial arts, man. They all got a, a lot to teach us, a lot to teach us. But like you said, uh, so many benefits in the athletic, in the, in the athletic realm. Like some days I'll come home from training, my body's beat up, you know, but like we had mentioned, our build, our, our body's innate ability to heal itself is incredible. And when we take all these stresses away, all of our brain power goes internal to do things like relax, recover, and de-stress, you know, so the recovery is incredibly upregulated. When our parasympathetic nervous system kicks in and our blood vasculature totally relaxes, the lactic acid from that workout, not only will the lactic acid production stop, but it'll really help flush out any lactic acid that's still in the muscles, any tension that's still in the muscles. Obviously, you're getting the benefits from the magnesium, soothing the muscles, chilling them, helping in enhancing that recovery even further. And the zero gravity aspect, just letting everything decompress all the stress in our spine and our joints from a tough workout, you know? But what's fascinating to me is once you, if you're a high performer, a high performing athlete, you know, we get to a point where even just 1% more, more speed, more power, more oxygen consumption, any of these things is drastic. You know, that's the difference between a, a W or an L, you know? So, what we see with even with even within the first 10 minutes of a float session, we see oxygen consumption drop over 20 percent, you know, and our ability to holster more oxygen for these athletic tasks uh, gets upregulated tremendously, tremendously. So whether it's before a workout to do things like that. Uh, or even just prep, visualize, or afterwards to decompress, relax, get back to that baseline. There's a lot of benefits in there for athletic tasks, especially marksman-related tasks, whether it's free throwing, uh, dart throwing, um, 
any any marksman type tax tasks you know because our ability to concentrate is so fine-tuned and hyper aware there's been incredible studies the shooting all of it the hunting you know um so our ability to zone in focus and really lock in to whatever we're trying to do is upregulated tremendously so there's been amazing studies on athletic performance and i'm fascinated by that whole realm and it's helped me a ton in my martial arts career i'll tell you that that's awesome and i think you left with me was it petroleum jelly vaseline or something if you have a cut you just slap that on and then yeah. you don't get that sting. yes and that's another thing too like I, I always recommend no try not to shave day of you know uh try not to get a haircut right before or a tattoo or nothing because um this again this is extremely concentrated saltwater solution that if it gets on a cut or anything like that can burn a little bit you know you'll you'll know so yeah we we keep some petroleum jelly right near the tank and if you got any cuts or or, or anything like that put a little petroleum jelly on and you'll be cooking this is a really good one are the benefits the same for a deaf or blind person? That is a good one. I like it. <laughs> Tremendous <laughs> question. As far as I know, there haven't been any studies conducted on that yet. <laughs> but what I can say, what I can speak on, is a part of your brain called the RAS system, right? And we can think of this system as being like the sensitivity knob of our senses you know our awareness and we all know that if we go into an environment that's like dark if we take away one of our senses the rest heighten right so oftentimes these people are already heightened with their other senses but what we see is when we take away all of your senses they all heighten by a tremendous amount over 20 percent you know, so that's why we see things like these marksman related tasks, our ability to do this goes through the roof. But for someone that's deaf or that's blind, like we said, they already are oftentimes hyper aware. Um, people that are autistic or on the spectrum at all, sensory disorders, they have a lot going on. So it's very important, especially for these people to get away from the external stimulation get back down to that baseline, let their brains chill, their nervous systems calm a little bit, de-stress, re-regulate, recenter, and then go back out into the world. Uh, so I do know multiple deaf and or uh, blind clients that have found great relief from just getting away from the sensory overload for a little bit, unplugging and uh, moving through their day a little bit more swiftly and, and relaxed. You ever see the movie, uh daredevil being being rames i feel like we'd create a bunch of those where it's like hyper aware you know, just knock with the cane and then see everything vibrating <laughs> like i'm there sometimes man. <laughs> yeah we had someone ask how many floats until you start seeing other dimensions <laughs> how, how many licks to let's the tootsie pop you know <laughs> uh, dude, that's it's it's fascinating but again like you said it's Really not the number of floats, just how deep you can go, how much you can relax. But you can definitely get some funky realms, as I'm sure you've seen, you know. Gets gets really spiritual in there, that's for sure. Yeah, this is a, another fascinating one, just ending on the weird ones here. <laughs> Are we getting someone else's energetic water structure, and how does that affect us? So I guess they're talking yes. about a public float tank. Uh, and that, that's a great question. You know, so that's why at my centers and my personal tank, I do have, it's something that as we get more sensitive, like most people, you will not feel that, you know, your awareness isn't at that level yet. Um, and it's fortunate for most people. And that, that can be the thing with some public tanks, you know, again, the cleanliness of the water is not an issue. Uh, the cleanliness is not an issue because these filtration systems, especially of our, our new Serenity floats tanks are high quality, you know. Um, the water is getting filtered over two dozen times in between each client, every single molecule uh, passed through a, a micron filter, blasted with UV light, blasted with ozone, dosed with, with the chemical disinfectant, hydrogen peroxide. So this water is good as new. The solution is good as new before every client. 
Uh, but the energy aspect can remain, you know? So that's why it's important to me, like at my tank, uh, if anyone else comes in, oftentimes I'll have uh, a Reiki practitioner. I'm going to work on it myself a little bit. Reiki the water, help uh, release some of that negative energy, you know, or even just taking a little bit of the water and putting it through a water structure, you know, and even just, even if we just take a gallon of the water and structure that, it will entrain the rest of the solution as well. Um, but again, not something most of us have to worry about. <laughs> but if you are hyper concerned or hypersensitive, um, pick up some Reiki skills before you go to the float center or get your own tank. You know, don't gotta worry about it. <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, your website, Serenity floats.com uh great blog posts up there faq uh you have your tanks on there you have uh a pod and then you have square ones right which you can be you can turn like a whole room into a float room if yes. you want yeah man the so the open takes are fascinating because mm -hmm. like we said a lot of our chambers when i was getting into the industry to start my first float was in almost like a like a coffin box type tank you know and I was laying in there and I was like, man, like, again, if I'm looking to make this thing more easily accessible to a wider audience, we got to make some serious edits to make this thing more, more inviting, you know, more aesthetically pleasing. And so what we did is we created the egg shaped pod, which is much more spacious. Plus it allows the condensation to run down the sides as well. But what we've been doing is some of the anxious and claustrophobic clients don't like the idea of being encapsulated. And since the anxious and claustrophobic clients are a uh, primary concern to us, a lot of the people and the patients we've been working with are severely anxious, you know, and, and claustrophobia is a form of anxiety. So what we ended up doing was designing one of the world's first open float chambers. And this, if you imagine a, like a, a pool, very inviting, no, no enclosure over the top at all, but you can just go in this tank, lie down, float like you're floating in an open pool, and now the only difference with that is now the whole room around the tank is calibrated yeah, with humidity, with temperature. There's a heater on the ceiling, keep the air that constant 94 degrees, the heater, keep the solution that constant 94.5 degrees. Uh, but yeah, so for any anxious or claustrophobic clients, I always try to steer them towards that open float tank. The pod's a great option. Then we also have a more residential unit as well, which is a little bit smaller. So. If anyone's looking for any info, you feel free to hit me up. Uh, zip, me, zip me a question on the website. We're active on there too. Um, yeah, check out the website. See what you guys think. And if, if you're interested, definitely let me know. And I'll, I'll, I'll help you get a good setup. Love it. Well, thank you, Max. Uh, really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and for really upgrading my life on all levels with your product. It's been incredible and I'm excited to see how it goes in a, a year from now, two years from now, I'm definitely not going to stop. Um, as, as you posted on your page, what I thought was going to be an advanced biohack turned out to be the important, the most important tool I've ever used for my physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. I love that quote. That quote lights me up. It's awesome. <laughs> I feel the same way, man. I feel the same way. But uh, like I said, dude, even... Even your hospitality had me out there last month and the way you treated me and uh, treated me like fam it was awesome, dude. And uh, you continue to educate the masses, lead by example. You know, it was awesome being out there with you and seeing you actually live everything that you talk about. You see so many, so many influencers in quotes, you know, kind of going out and um, not, not walking the walk, but you are one of those dudes. And I, I see that and I respect that. And, um, just thank you again, brother. I appreciate it. Appreciate that, Max. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll put all the links below so you guys could check out his stuff. And uh, yeah, stick around as I close out uh -oh. the show. Thank you, Thanks, brother. Thanks, man. Well, I hope you were inspired to float after that one. I really like all of the practical tips that Max gave, especially around breathing. I find that area is so neglected and people don't realize how much they can control their stress level 
and the state of the nervous system just through breath. I found it really interesting that Max said 80% of the nervous system workload goes to processing sensory inputs and the forces of gravity. I often contemplate the sensory input of being indoors. Like today, it's been a heavy workday for me. I haven't been outside much versus going on a hiking trail or just walking in the forest. And that's a different kind of sensory overload because all the micro movements of all the plants and it's a lot of stimulation, but it's not digital. It's not pixelated. That probably makes a big difference. It's probably a multitude of things be a fun show to have. What fascinates me the most of sensory deprivation floating is the suppressed memories that can come up as I spoke about in the show, things that you thought you didn't care about, but your body, for whatever reason, held onto it. And that will create muscle tension, stiffness, lack of mobility. Really fascinating to me, the emotional connection and the trauma connection to those things, because it seems like it's a direct link. And the more floats that I do, the deeper I seem to go into that relaxation state where I'm able to relax an area that I wasn't able to relax before. And I'm being very patient with the process, not trying to rush it, not trying to do anything. I just go in there with the intention to let go and relax as fully as I can. And as I mentioned to Max, breathing, which is... Interesting, because there's that connection, Max said, breathing it out, feel it to heal it. There's a connection between all of those things. I like that Adam Bergstrom says yawning, stretching, and sticking your tongue out are great ways to release traumas and to process them. Makes sense to me. It's been interesting to watch my breath in the tank and notice that kind of tightness where it gets harder to breathe, even slow, deep breaths, and I just need one big one. You might find that's the case in the tank and that you feel like you're going to bounce around the tank when you have that huge breath. That's how I feel. But all the sensations, it's super individual what you experience in there. And some of my friends have already messaged me saying they've had profound experiences. If you've never done a sensory deprivation float, I would say just search for a flotation spa in your area. I would say go in with no expectations. Don't get drugged up beforehand. Just go in sober, the intention to relax and be open to whatever happens. But on his website, serenityfloats.com, there's a great why float section. And it says float therapy improves muscular pain, chronic pain, fatigue, high blood pressure, migraine, headache, jet lag, anxiety, insomnia, back pain, depression. I know there's a lot of people dealing with all of these things. So if you can do a therapy that's an all-in-one, and it's hard to say what's doing it. Is it the zero gravity? Is it the thousand pounds of magnesium salts? Is it the sensory deprivation and not having one photon of light hit your eyes or your skin? Or is it all the above? I would say it's the combination of all of that. So I'd say if you were inspired by this show, just commit to three rounds, ideally back to back, day after day, uh, at least in the same week, and see how you feel. See how your nervous system feels. I felt it, as I said in the show, just after one float. But to me, the power is really in the consecutive floats. You're really lowering your baseline stress level. And you really don't know where that's at until you lower it. That's been my experience because I thought I was good. I had my metabolism on point. I wasn't skipping meals, restricting macronutrients. But I feel like this is a great adjunct therapy to 
all of the metabolic health information that I share on the show. And if you want to dive deeper, that book of floating, Exploring the Private Sea by Michael Hutchison, it's a fascinating read if you want to do a deep dive into the science of float therapy and all of the different effects that it has on the hemispheres of the brain and all the neurochemistry going on and all of the different theories of why it's beneficial. So find a float center, and if you want to commit to having your own at-home tank, definitely reach out to Max. Go on the website, serenityfloats.com. I think it's well worth it to have your own retreat from just the madness of the world. It seems like we're always in a downward spiral especially if you watch the news or just follow all of the wild events that are happening all the time. What I prefer to do is just to focus on my local community, helping my neighbors, quite literally, that's what I do, help my neighbors with different health stuff that they have going on and helping as much as I can online like through this platform, as crazy as it gets on the internet. It is absolutely a blessing and a curse. But technologies like this, like sensory deprivation float therapy, I believe is a must for any online quote-unquote entrepreneur or an educator or anyone that puts themselves out there online. It does take energy to deal with vampires or trolls or whatever you want to call it. Sensory deprivation is a charging station. It's a way to refill your cup so that you can provide for others. And it's been just profound for me beyond words. Just, again, one hour. It's a small time commitment in the grand scheme of things. Might seem like a long time, but the benefits of just one hour at least four days a week that's been kind of my cadence, and I'm still playing around with the frequency. I was doing daily for a while, but life comes up and you have to adapt. So I'm working on just setting a minimum per week time. And for me, that's just worked out to be at least four days a week. And I definitely feel the difference. So serenityfloats.com, they're on Instagram. That is their handle, Serenity Floats. Big thanks to Max Casa for coming on the show and sharing his wisdom and experience. Everyone's dealing with some sort of health condition, and I wonder how much of it is exacerbated by the stress of these little boxes in our face. And again, it's about balance. So it's not about throwing your iPhone off a bridge into a lake and saying, screw it, I'm just going to the cave or I'm going to the forest. I've seen people do that and eventually they're back on YouTube uploading videos and things. But I think we're at a point where we're connected whether we like it or not, unless you just go full Amish, just bartering with your neighbors, (laughs) milk and eggs and cheese and meat. I think at this point we have to learn to live in balance with technology, especially when we have satellites circling the earth, beaming us no matter where we are. It's really about adapting. Adapting is the name of the game. And adapting and thriving. And to me, that journey starts with the nervous system. If you're stressed all the time, for a myriad of reasons, right? Extreme dieting, fasting, wild protocols, whatever it is, that will just exacerbate the stress that our nervous system is already under. I largely got into health for anti-aging and longevity. And I've realized now that it's a little simpler than I made it out to be. It's really about increasing our resilience to stressors and that could be done with food especially animal products food frequency 
carbohydrates. It can be done with breathing. And it can be done with sensory deprivation floating. It is another tool to use to increase our resiliency to stress. So if you want to support the show, you can go to matt-blackburn.com. I have my recommended products listed there, my blog posts, my CLF protocol, and my brand is called MitoLife. M-I-T-O-L-I-F-E dot C-O is the website. I have mixed acophrol, vitamin E, spore-based probiotics, systemic enzymes, and a phthalate-free capsule. I have niacinamide. I have a product called Dairy Absorb, which is lactase enzyme. If someone has issues digesting dairy or they're just getting back into eating dairy again because of how nutritious it is, dairy is a great source of retinol, which helps a ton with iron overload, with the whole process of iron recycling. You need retinol to convert copper into active copper, which is called ceruloplasmin. And dairy could be very helpful for that. And I have two products that are out right now. It's Purely K and Shilajit. Those will both be back next week. And thank you so much for your continued support, sharing this podcast with your friends, sharing the MitoLife products, and getting the word out there about what we should prioritize with our health. See you next Friday. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.